What's going on, everybody? It's Brian Tripp. I'm here in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm actually at the law offices of Jeff Parmer. I'm with Jeff Parmer. How's it going today, Jeff? Hey, Brian. I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well. We are going to bring you guys some videos every week, some specific videos, obviously, to our area, obviously, to our area here in Birmingham, but uh, also some stuff that's um, practical that you guys can actually use and uh, legal advice that you can use and take with you in your real estate investing business. And today's topic, we want to talk about contracts. And I've got some specific questions about contracts sure. that I would love to get your advice on and I know everybody here watching is going to want to understand as well. So I've heard a lot of things about contracts and you never know what's right. Some is it, some of it's hearsay, some of it an actual attorney has said that this is true. Just let's just start from the very elementary level, Jeff. What are some specific things that every contract, every real estate purchase contract must have for it to be an actual contract? Sure, sure, Brian. There are a handful of things that need to be in every real estate contract. First, you need to have the identity of the buyers and the identity of the sellers. We need to know what property is being conveyed. You can use legal description. Uh, you can use property address. You can use a combination of those two. Some people put in the parcel ID number just as added information. Um, you need to have the sales price and you need to have um, the time period in which the contract's going to be performed. In other words, when is closing going to take place? And really, once you've covered those bases, everything else is really just kind of added information for the parties. Any signatures? You need signatures, yes okay. sir. Right. Absolutely. So I've got two specific items that you did not mention there Okay. that I want to know do I have to have these in an executable um, contract here in the state of Alabama? One is earnest money. Yes. My opinion is, and that is my opinion, uh, is that you would need uh, earnest money for the contract to be able to be enforced. If the contract is violated by one of the parties at one point in the future and there's no earnest money that's changed hands, I believe that the other party could raise the issue of lack of consideration for the contract which means the contract would not be enforceable. That's why you see, even if it's a token amount of earnest money, some amount of earnest money actually changing hands at the time the contract's executed. So I've heard a lot of different things when it comes to that, and you, you were very specific to say the very first words out of your mouth were, it's my opinion. Yes. Just talk about that, that it's, that's your opinion, and it, could be, it sounds like it could be someone else's opinion that you don't need earnest money. Why is that the case? Well, I think any time that you talk to two lawyers, a lot of the time you get two different opinions. And um, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that uh, in Alabama, a lot of our law comes from case law, cases provided, uh, decided by our appellate courts in, in cases past. And you can look at case law and you can find support for either position, really, I believe. But I usually just tell folks, look, you know, be on the safe side. If you're serious about this deal, um, either from the buyer perspective or the seller perspective, let's put some earnest money down on it. Okay, so that so earnest money, it sounds to me like you're saying it's a good idea yes. to do it. Yes. But it may not necessarily be something I have to do. May not. May not. But you may not want to go down that road if something were to happen. Yes, and, okay. if, and if I was a seller and someone was asking to buy my property and they were not willing to put earnest money on the contract, I would be you know, very uh, concerned, I guess, about their ability to perform. And on the other side of the coin, if you're the, the buyer of the property, you, know, you do want to have the seller holding, or somebody holding earnest money on the seller's behalf um, just to ensure that the seller does intend to go forward with this and right. that you're serious about it. Right. So, so where, you said earnest money change hands. Yes. Where should earnest money go? Well, it can go several different places. It can be paid directly to the seller. Is that, is that wise? Not usually. Okay. I usually tell folks either let your real estate agent hold it if there's an agent involved, or let the title company hold it, okay. or closing attorney hold it, pending closing. Gotcha. We've all got trust accounts, and we can hold it in our trust account. Okay, so earnest money was one thing I didn't hear you said. The second thing, when, when I, you went down through that list of different items that need to be in every contract, I didn't hear you say anything about a contract being assignable. 
So I think a lot of the gurus out there teach that you have to write your name and or assigns in order for a contract to be assignable. In the state of Alabama, do I have to write and or assigns for the contract to be assignable? Or are all contracts assignable no matter what? No, I believe that you would need to write in and or assigns uh, if you're the buyer and you want the ability to assign the contract at some point in the future. I do believe you need to, to write in and or assigns. Or somewhere in the body of the contract, make it clear that you may want to assign the contract to another entity at some point before closing. Okay, so I heard you say, I believe. Yes. In my opinion, these are things that like, we don't, investors don't, we want like ironclad. Tell us what to do. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if the world was black and white and I could say, do it, here's why, this is the ironclad reason why. But real estate, like so many other areas of law, is not a black and white business much of the time. There are lots of gray areas. And I think a lot of what we do as attorneys is to try to help people navigate through and around the gray areas right. and uh, hopefully stay out of them if possible or once you get into them, help you find the best way out of them. Yep. So the advice I'm giving you is, as I said, my opinion, my best advice. Another attorney may give their own client some different advice. By all means, always listen to your own attorney if you're seeking his or her advice. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. Appreciate it. Um, tune back in maybe next week. We'll have another great real estate investing tip for you guys.